You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron. Now here's your host, Ethan Haristadulu. Welcome back, everybody, to the Greek's Gridiron. I am Ethan Haristadulu, and today we take a look at the AFC South, ranking their defenses specifically from worst to first as we go through. So I invite you all to comment down below. Let me know how would you rank the AFC South defenses from bottom to top here? What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? All of that fire away in the comment section down below. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. We're getting very close to wrapping up defenses. I've already done a vast majority of the league six divisions. We got this one and one more other to go in the NFC South. And then we'll be moving over to offenses as well as we work closer and closer to the start of the NFL season, but beginning with number four and working our way up to the top at the very bottom after much consideration, and I'm probably going to get a lot of crap from fellow Indianapolis Colts fans, but I'm sorry, I'm going to put our team at the bottom of this list here. Now, this could, and I want to stress and emphasize the could be a bit of a make or break season, in my opinion, for Gus Bradley here as Indianapolis comes in and they boast one of the more impressive defensive fronts in the NFL for a team that really only has to rush for each and every single week that they play. They get a lot of damage done and they don't really have to blitz a ton. And you can see it in the numbers as well. They finished the league fifth in sacks, fifth in tackles for loss. They had four different guys hit eight sacks last season. Very impressive group up front. But then from there, you kind of have yourself about like an average unit or so the rest of the way here. Like I think Indianapolis is absolutely loaded on the defensive line. And then for the, for the rest of it, it's you have good guys or like somewhere around average to slightly above or slightly below. And I'm a Colts fan. So before anyone sits here and says, I'm just bashing them to bash them. I'm not, this is the team that I like to root for here, but I am trying to be realistic with expectations here based off what we saw last year. And also keeping in mind the fact that it, this is vastly the same defense for the most part. Like you're basically looking at the same exact group of starters that you had planned for going into last season, coming into this season now, which continuity is great. Don't get me wrong, but there definitely is some concerns. Secondary being very, very young. A lot of guys within the last four drafts that are going to be starting a lot of snaps for you all. And if not starting, just getting a bunch of rotational snaps on top of that. Linebacker room, I would say, is good, but I wouldn't say is great by any means. But I would say you do have a good core of guys there. Now, when you look at like player changes and just how things will look a little bit differently from last year going into this year... There's really not a lot. You obviously have, I would say, the biggest piece in addition to this defense here being UCLA pass rusher Leatu Latu. He's going to headline this whole conversation here. Neck injury aside, super excited to see how he plays out for the Indianapolis Colts. Like I said, you already had a really good group of guys going after the quarterback, and I think he only takes that group and elevates it even further and puts them in the conversation for strongest defensive front in the division here. Now, besides that, and the 23 and a half sacks that he's coming in with over the last couple of seasons in college. You have Raekwon Davis, who's coming in, a free agent signing to the defense. I expect him to be a rotational piece to work in alongside DeForest Buckner and, of course, Grover Stewart. And then you have some late round additions in guys like cornerbacks Micah Abraham and Jalen Simpson, linebacker Jalen Carleys, all just intriguing depth guys, but no one that I'm really expecting to step in year one and really be like impact playmakers for the defense. You, of course, have some guys that you'll be looking at to hopefully get a little bit of better. Uh, just better play from overall this year and also just being on the field more this year as well. You have Juju Brents who missed eight games last season. You had Grover Stewart who was suspended the first six games of last season. I look at Indianapolis and I, and I just think the unit overall is, is tough to kind of assess and it, it, you kind of have to just project and expect to see improvements from certain guys when it comes to trying to break down what this defense could look like. You're either expecting certain guys to regress that were there last year, or you're expecting them to progress this year. There's not like these massive additions on either side from free agency or anything like that, that really change what this defense looks like going into this next year under Gus Bradley. But again, I look at it as kind of like a make or break season here, because for the good that we talked about when we first started talking Indianapolis, there were concerns as a team that was allowing nearly 360 yards total to their opponents last year. They finished last in the division in points per game allowed, and they were near the bottom of the league in that number overall. There are 
some concerns, and I think a lot of it has to do with just how young the secondary is and inexperienced they are outside of Kenny Moore being in the nickel spot. And then, of course, again, linebacker room, good. I don't necessarily know if I would say great, but I do think overall is a very good unit. So we'll see. We need to see some progress from some of these guys here, but overall, I don't want to sit here and say that there's no chance that Indianapolis leapfrogs any of the other defenses in this division here. I just feel like with not too many changes and me not walking away from last season being overly impressed aside from what the defensive line did, I don't really know what to expect exactly here. Now, moving into the number three spot, this is where things get a little bit interesting because we saw pretty much everybody else in this division make some pretty big key changes in a lot of different areas. And... At number three, after a lot of consideration here, and I flip-flopped with my number two and number three teams quite a bit going into this one here, I settled on the Jacksonville Jaguars at that number three spot here. Now, in 2023, you had yourself, I guess I should say Ryan Nielsen, who's coming in now as your new defensive coordinator. In 2023, he was the guy defensive coordinator for the Atlanta Falcons. He also spent some time on the Saints coaching staff prior to that. He's known for some pretty good defenses over the last few years of his coaching career. Jacksonville, I would say, has an argument for strongest linebacker group within this division here. I think they're a really talented pair of guys in Devin Lloyd. And you, of course, have yourself Foye uh, Foye Oluokin is such a hard name to pronounce there. I really hope I'm not messing that up too badly there. But overall, I do think that they have a strong pairing when it comes to that linebacker spot. And then you also have like Chad Muma and Ventrell Miller behind them as well. But I do think they have a good argument for strongest linebacker core in the division here. You couple that with Trayvon Walker, who finally put all of his physical tools together. And the game obviously slowing down for him a little bit there this past season, racking up 10 sacks and now paired alongside Josh or Josh Hines Allen, excuse me, who is now his opposite running mate as well, getting paid this season, so he is secured for the long run in Jacksonville. You have a one-two punch on the ends of your defensive front there, coupled with that strong linebacking group, and honestly a secondary that has some pretty good names on it as well. I really like the direction that this team could be heading here. Now, when you look at some of the changes that Jacksonville made and why I think they should be above Indianapolis here at the very least, I do think bringing in a guy like defensive lineman Eric Armstead, he basically solidifies the interior of your defensive line here. Someone through his career who has 33 and a half sacks, 302 tackles, 43 tackles for loss during his, what was it, like nine years that he's been in San Francisco. This is someone who year in and year out has been extremely effective at what he does in stuffing the run and even getting after the quarterback and creating some pressure. I think he's a nice addition that defenses have to account for on the interior, which honestly should just help Trayvon Walker and Josh Hines Allen now and enabling them to maybe push things even further with the pressure and getting after the quarterback. Outside of that, you have safety Darnell Savage, who's coming, or excuse me, safety corner, whatever it is exactly that he's going to be identifying as in this defense here. But he's coming in defensive back Darnell Savage who's going to probably maybe make some, I don't know exactly what he's going to do because it's weird. I saw him listed and if, let me just double check this here. Yeah. He's listed as the nickelback here. So he's not going to be in the safety spot that he has spent some time in while he was in green Bay, but I'm assuming if need be, he could play there, but it sounds like from the way things are shaking out, it's going to be uh, you're looking at Andre Cisco and Antonio Johnson who are going to be leading the way at safety, but we'll see what kind of, uh, what kind of role Darnell Savage ultimately plays, but it sounds like, nickel is where they're going to slot him to start and again these depth charts per hour lads this is just what i'm going by but he's going to come in here someone who's been rock solid during his time in green bay nine interceptions 32 career pass breakups to this point here coming off a bit of an injury riddled season with seven missed games last year but i'll be curious to see what kind of role he carves out but again a rock solid addition for the defense then you have ronald darby nine-year vet guy that's been around the block he's gonna be playing the robin to tyson campbell's batman here so or at least that's where it's projected to start so far unless that changes as we go through training camp here coming up very soon. And then a bunch of draft picks that are going the defense as well. You got like LSU defensive lineman Mason Smith. They grabbed in the second round, third round pick. You had Mississippi State cornerback Jerry and Jones. So there is a lot of intrigue with some of these additions here that I like here. If Tyson Campbell comes, comes back this season, he's able to stay healthy Antonio Johnson, who I just previously mentioned now, is slated to start opposite of Andre Sisco. Looks like he earned that starting role there, at least to start going into training camp. He played in 13 games last year, only three starts, but now he's going to get that opportunity to be opposite of Andre Sisco. I think you're shaping up to be a formidable defense, at least in my opinion here. Now, obviously, there is the big concern 
does this group end up running out of gas the way they did last year? I think injuries, both offensively and defensively, and just not necessarily what was like a collapse of the entire team, but you know, things started to mount. It got really ugly, ugly. And when your franchise quarterback is battling through like what felt like two, three, four injuries, the offense is not moving the way it probably should be. It, the, the the morale starts to kind of dip. People start to to give up late in the season. Your playoff hopes are slowly slipping away as you get loss after loss, and things just kind of compounded at the end of the year. If Jacksonville can avoid all of that. I do think that this group here should be a fearsome group. I think with an offense that is kind of rejuvenated with some of the additions they have on that side, maybe they end up not putting the defense in some tough spots like they did last year. So a lot of that is dependent, again, on how they play, keeping yourself from you know losing your motivation late in the season, whatever you want to say, cause the kind of defensive and honestly offensive collapse last year as well. I think that this group should take a step forward and get back in the right direction here. Coming in at the number two spot, after a lot of consideration here, I am looking forward to what they're doing. I do have some concerns here, but a little bit less than I do with Jacksonville, and that is going to be the Tennessee Titans. Now, when you look at how this is going to be shaping up for them this year, Denard Wilson coming in his first season as defensive coordinator in Tennessee, his recent track record He's been working with some pretty impressive defenses here as a guy that's been working with secondaries for the most part. In 2023, he was in Baltimore. A couple years prior to that, he was with the Philadelphia Eagles, and the secondary over there was a very strong unit the last couple of seasons prior to this past. So you have that. And then also when you look back to what he was doing in New York from 2017 to 2020, working with guys like Jamal Adams and Marcus May, who were having some of the best seasons of their careers back then, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do, especially when you consider some of the additions that they've made in this secondary, not only just this past season, but over the last few years as well. I think we're looking at what could be a pretty threatening defense here, despite, you know, when you look at last year, you probably don't think of the Tennessee Titans as some formidable opponent, but defensively, despite some of the struggles this team had overall, they were a sneaky solid unit. I would say they were average at worst and maybe even slightly above average at best. I mean, yeah, you look at some of the numbers, 16th in points per game allowed, 16th ranked third down defense. Like, okay, that's average. But then you kind of dive into the weeds a little bit, and teams weren't scoring a lot against Tennessee. They were they tied for eighth in passing touchdowns allowed, allowed last year, tied for fourth in rushing touchdowns allowed. They were the number one ranked red zone defense in the NFL last season. And I know... That was Mike Vrabel's team. That was his staff that was leading this defense here. But you do have a decent amount of the key pieces from that defense still around. And I think you did a really good job of adding some intriguing pieces coupled with the excellent players you already have that you've been building around, Jeffrey Simmons, anyone, that this could be a unit that takes a step forward. I am a little bit concerned about what the offense might do to this defense on their end, putting them in bad spots. I don't know if I'm necessarily sold on Will Levis just yet, but that remains to be seen. We'll kind of we'll probably get our true answers this next upcoming season, hopefully sooner rather than later as to what he is for this franchise. But I mean, you look at what they did this offseason and man and The Tennessee Titans, just the big trade for LeJarius Sneed. This is a guy who is so versatile in what he can do. He's not only a guy that can drop back in coverage and lock up some of your favorite wide receivers, but he's a guy that's not afraid to get in there and get physical as well. Someone who's had over 100 tackles at the cornerback position. You don't get a ton of corners that are all about mixing it up like that. So for a guy like him to come in, on top of that, he has six and a half career sacks, 10 interceptions, 40 pass breakups. Like This is a do-it-all kind of cornerback. I am a little bit worried about his 10 tendency at times to get a little too physical and he draws a penalty a little bit more often than you would like but overall I mean you want a guy to lead your secondary I think Legereus Sneed is an excellent guy in doing that Jadobia Wuzier was brought in as well and this is one of those things where I am slightly concerned because it felt like last year he was struggling to really get back to his full speed coming off of his injury so if he can just get back to form this is a phenomenal signing and even if he doesn't quite get back to where he was at his peak before going down I do think that with Legereus Sneed being the number one on this defense here he's not going to be seeing the absolute best of every single team every single snap so it does take take a little bit of the pressure off him and I think him being a strong number two is a solid compliment to what Snead brings to the table you also have guys like linebacker Kenneth Murray and Sebastian Joseph Day coming in to add to this defense as well and then most recently you're looking at safety Jamal Adams who signed a one-year prove-it deal who as I mentioned earlier spent 
and had his best seasons under Denard Will or Denard Wilson back when he was in New York. So there's a lot to be excited about with Tennessee. Couple that with second round pick defensive tackle Tavondre Sweat, who is an exciting pairing, I would argue, with Jeffrey Simmons. Big man, 6'4", 340 pounds. Coming off a career best season, couple of sacks, eight tackles for loss. He had 45 tackles on the year altogether. And some day three draft selections as well that you're looking at who could find some contribution time as well. As long as some of these big signings end up working out, everyone buys into what the defense is going to be looking like this year under Denard Wilson. And on top of that, Jeffrey Simmons, you want him to stay healthy. He missed five games last year. Tennessee's got an extremely talented group of guys. And and I think you have two really big key pieces at some very important positions being at defensive tackle and at quarterback or cornerback, excuse me, with Jeffrey Simmons and Legereus Sneed. You have two key pieces that you're building a unit around right now. I'm really excited to see what this unit can do here. And I think that Tennessee might surprise some people. And I honestly think some people are probably surprised with me having Tennessee at number two. I'll be curious to see what you all say. But Tennessee has got some juice on that defense here. A lot of it is a matter of if these new additions end up paying off. But on paper, looking at the way this unit is shaping up and based off of how much fight they had last year, despite not necessarily the uh, smoothest of roads going through the 2023 season, I'm really looking forward to seeing the progress of this unit. And especially if the offense gets better this year, Will Levis improves and the offense isn't putting them in you know not so great situations, you might see this defense progress even further to being just an average defense to being maybe a, a defense that's flirting somewhere within like the top 12 of the league or something like that. And then, of course, finally, at the number one spot, who else is it going to be but the Houston Texans here? I, I, I sat down for a decent amount of time, I will be honest, and I was trying to come up with ways to maybe try to uh, talk myself out of the Houston Texans here because I, I, I come into these with kind of like a preconceived notion of what I want to list the teams as and then, you know, going through the numbers and research of player personnel moving and whatnot, uh, do, like things will start to change from there. But I kind of came in with I'm going to have Houston at number one and I'm going to sit here and try to convince myself not to have them at one and I couldn't really end up doing it. When you look at just how good this unit was under D'Amico Ryans and Matt Burke last season, they finished 2023 ranked as the sixth best run defense in the NFL, allowing the second lowest in terms of yards per attempt at 3.5. They finished 11th in points per game allowed. They were second in total tackles for loss. They were the fifth best third down defense. They were 11th in red zone defense. The issues really just were they had a tough time slowing down teams through the air. They weren't necessarily the best when it came to racking up sacks and pressure so if they can get a little bit better on that front alone we're talking a defense that's flirting with the possibility of being like a top five if not maybe top eight unit in the league here and when you look at what they did to basically shore up what was again an already fairly impressive defense last year you trade out Jonathan Grenard which I was a little bit shocked about until we saw the Daniil Hunter signing he comes in 87 and a half career sacks 108 tackles for loss he had the highest total tackles for loss in his career in a season last year you have Daniil Hunter now he's set in the ends opposite of of course Will Anderson Jr. Then you bring in a guy who is like an AFC South journeyman, but someone who is also coming off of a career best season on top of that into Nico Autry, who had 11 and a half sacks. He had 50 tackles and nearly 12 tackles for loss as well. I mean, it, it, I can't believe that Houston was allowed to do what they were allowed to do this offseason. And I know a lot of people are sitting here and probably saying, well, everyone knows they're coming now. People won't be caught off guard. Their schedule is going to be more difficult. I'm well aware. I get it. But this was a very impressive defense last year and one that should not have been as impressive as it was going into last season. And for them to come out the way they did and go into this offseason, and it was clear the mission was get C.J. Stroud in that offense's defense to be even better than where they were this past year. You couple that with some other guys like Foley Fatukasi. You have Tim Settle coming in on the interior of the defensive line as well. You went and got a guy in Aziz Al Shair, rock solid linebacker addition to the defense, who's coming off his career best as well. 17 games, 163 tackles, nine tackles for loss, a couple of sacks. My only real question about this defense, and again, I know it is the concern. They were about an average defense or so against the pass. But 
you brought in so much talent that I'm I'm very curious to see how things shake out in the secondary. Jeff Okuda's coming in. We all know the upside that everyone believes he had as a first round selection. CJ Henderson was another guy who was drafted pretty early who just hasn't quite worked out anywhere. Michael Ford and Miles Bryant, two guys that have been serviceable to pretty good in, in the areas that they've come and played from as well. I'm really curious to see which one of those four guys steps up and plays opposite of Derek Stingley Jr. Because if one of those guys can get hot and be the number two, the Robin to Stingley's Batman, you have a serious group of guys with talent that maybe they couldn't quite reach the level of like, you know, number one corner, but you're putting them in a position now where you have your number one and these guys just have to play number two, number three at best. And they're going up against lesser competition, I guess you could say, with the number two and number three wide receivers, four of the opposing team here. These guys could flourish, or at least one of them, right? You're hoping for that at the very least. Then you look at some of the draft picks. You have second round pick out of Georgia, cornerback Kamari Lasseter, a disruptor, maybe not known for his interceptions, but a guy who's not afraid to get in there, mix it up, break up a pass or two. And then you got like a third round selection and safety, Kalen Bullock, traditional free safety, guy that's going to man the top of the defense. He has nine career interceptions coming out of college as well this is a group that is extremely talented extremely young but extremely talented and then they did a good job this offseason of bringing in vets that I think are going to help push this defense to the next level here you have a very good blend of guys that are experienced with a lot of really young guys that are earning their spot and making names for themselves in front of us as it happens and this is a team that not only made the playoffs but won a playoff game this past off or this past postseason so it really comes down to who winds up working out at the cornerback spot. Again, I look at Derek Stingley Jr. He's obviously the guy over there. I think Kamari Lasseter is probably going to see a decent amount of playing time. He is slated, I believe, at this moment as the guy opposite of Derek Stingley. But, you know, we'll see how that shakes up if that ends up being the case. You have Desmond King, obviously, who's playing the nickel spot there. He's slated to start at that position, at least at this current moment. But I'm very curious to see how those cornerback signings play out because... Again, these are guys that had so much talent coming into the league or maybe guys that have proved themselves a lot that look at like a guy like Miles Bryant from New England, guys that have proved their worth that they don't have to be the number ones. They don't even have to probably be the number twos. They're the guys that are going to come in and relieve the guys that are taking on the ones and twos. And I think that's going to be very good for them. And I look at Houston as like the clear cut definitive favorite in the AFC South. But those are my rankings for the defenses here in that South Division of the AFC. Let me know in the comments your thoughts, your opinions. What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? What am I getting right? What am I getting wrong? Would love to hear from you all and discuss. But that's it for me as always. If you made it to the end, I greatly appreciate it. I'll see you all next time. Have a good one.